Jeff, let me ask you a question. What do you think about dams? What do I think about dams? Uh, I think first, if you were to ask me broadly, dams in general, uh, I would say of the beaver variety, probably right. pretty good. <laughs> right. Okay. What about the kind made by people? <laughs> the kind made by people is a little bit more of a mixed bag in my in my sort of uh, you know breadth of knowledge on the subject. Just in that. You know, I think dams have a little bit of a, a duality to them. They, one, they provide a lot of uh, uh, energy to a lot of people in the world. And this energy, you know, the energy that's creating at the time is is pretty clean, right? It's it's not, you know, creating a lot of the carbon emissions necessarily, you know, as the energy is coming up. Now, obviously, the other side of this coin is that a lot of carbon emissions go into the construction of dam just by nature. That's a lot of concrete, right? as well as some of the... And I, I would say this is probably a very noticeable, but maybe not quite as well perceived uh, n- a negative sort of externality around dams. But some of the ecological hazards around sort of the fish, uh, the the rivers, which, you know, obviously are very important to a lot of different aspects of the world. And then I know just off the top of my head that quite a few dam constructions have resulted in sort of the forced migrations of of quite a lot of people around the world in various areas. And We'll probably talk about some of those today. I'm guessing. We're going to talk about all of those things today gonna- because today the topic is geography is dams. And these these costs and benefits that you mentioned are, are some of what we're going to talk about. Uh, so let's get into it. Yeah. And I would say this is, this is now our third uh, episode that's sort of tackling, I think it's third, tackling a, an energy source, which are- right. Because we, 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 we did hydro, with, yeah. we did, uh, I'm sorry, we did um, wind power. We did wind power. We and did nuclear, uh, power. nuclear energy. And right. so I think this is the third. And I think these these are really fun episodes for us because energy, I think, well, energy is so geographic in its nature. And I, and I think every time we do one of these episodes, each energy source has a very different kind of geography attached to them. And it's very it's very interesting just to see how, for lack of a better word, people have figured out how ways to exploit sort of the the planet in various ways and sort of how that gets transferred around the globe into people's homes, such as what we're doing right now. That's as we right. And this, this will podcast. not be the last such topic that we'll explore on this podcast either. No, Stay we absolutely have more. <laughs> other ones coming up. But, you know, a good place for us to continue with this conversation, I think, is the Nova Akovka Dam in Ukraine. Because uh, we're oh. recording this episode in late June 2023. And on June 6, 2023, an explosion caused the collapse of the Novakovka Dam uh, on the Dnipro River in the Kherson region of Ukraine. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is this is very recent. This was, yeah. Just a, just a few weeks ago from the recording that you, from this recording right, right. now. Um, there's a lot to say about that. The Dnipro River is the front line or one of the front lines of the southern front of the war between Ukraine and Russia right now. So, uh, you know, it's significant for that. Uh, The land of the north of the river is controlled by Ukraine and the land of the south uh, has now is now controlled by Russia. This is a dam that's built in 1955 and the dam and the hydroelectric facilities that are associated with it are all controlled by Russia and have been for the last year. And I think, and this maybe gets off topic a little bit, but I think that this was one of the strategic locations that Russia really wanted to get their hands on when they began their invasion, in part due due to the power being able to generate to send to the Crimean Peninsula that they took over in 2014, as well as uh, being able to direct water and control the water source of of this river for, again, the, the Crimean Peninsula. Right. So already we're sort of highlighting that dams can figure very prominently in in war, in armed conflict. And this is an extremely recent example of that. Uh, the areas downstream were flooded when this there was an explosion on the they think that there was an explosion on the dam. Um, Ukraine has blamed Russia for it. Russia has blamed Ukraine. Uh, a lot of sources, media sources in the United States and the UK are suggesting that Russia is to blame. I think there was an international commission, uh, commission that was convened that is reluctant to, to to completely back up that that assessment. So um, I suppose that remains to be discovered still. 
Uh, there's a debate about that. But the, what we do know is that the areas downstream were flooded, putting over 40,000 people at risk from flooding. Uh, at least 14 people died as a direct result of the dam's destruction. Now, upstream from the river, there are concerns about the availability of water to cool the reactors at the Zeporizhia uh, nuclear plant, which is currently under Russian control. So water is diverted from the reservoir into some side areas that are used to to cool uh, the the reactor. And if you want to refer back to our our episode on nuclear energy, you can hear more about that. I was just um, going to say we yeah. because at the time that we recorded the nuclear episode, I think it's a two parter episode. Yes. At that time, the the current issues around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant were also happening, and so it's just it's just a weird. I don't know, I guess timing in that our, now our dams episode is happening around the same time as another sort of uh, big issue uh, around right. our facility in, in Ukraine as part of this war. Very fascinating. Apparently, UN nuclear officials have stated that there's no immediate danger to the plant, but I guess we need to stay tuned to that. Mm -hmm. um, there was flooding in the port city of Kherson, which is on the Dnipro River downstream from the dam and pretty close to the Black Sea. This is a city with a population of almost 280,000 people. The city was under Russian control from March to November 2022, and then recaptured by Ukraine forces in November of 2022. Uh, as Russian troops were losing control of the city, they destroyed a lot of infrastructure, including communications, water, heat, electricity facilities. So the people in this city have been through an awful lot in the last year and a half. Is the um, do we know if the two hundred eighty thousand population is that current estimates or pre war estimates? Um, I believe that they're pre war estimates. Gotcha. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that entire population was living in areas that were susceptible to flooding, but mm -hmm. the city was definitely uh, parts of the city were flooded and, and right. dramatically so, and you know, sort of drastic situation for many of the people who live there. I mean, um, how could it not be, right? I mean, right? if you're if you're a river city, you know, we're we're sitting here in Portland, also a river city, and if something similar happened, you know, just the amount of water is going to cause issues regardless. That's right. So the European Commission reported that after the dam broke, water levels in the the Kherson region increased by an average of over 18 feet. That's incredible. So that's that's an average, and that's not everywhere, yeah. but that some places were completely covered, right? Some people's right. homes, all kinds of different things. Oh um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen videos on, um, on on you know various news sources, sort of I, I don't know aerial imagery, and you can just see the amount of water that's sort of spreading throughout the land, for lack of a better word, right? It's clearly you know the water has risen risen to such a degree that it's now no longer contained to what would you would obviously I think recognize as sort of the the boundaries of the the previous. That's river. right. Yeah, there's some satellite <laughs> images out there of before and after mm -hmm. you know, a couple days before and, and the day after the 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 failure of the dam and maps that illustrate how much has been flooded and it's it's a huge change that happened very quickly mm -hmm. uh, and there's been all kinds of impacts that will be long lasting from this as well so in the region of Kherson according to CNN 94% of the irrigation systems now have no source of water and then and in two other nearby regions, 74 and 30% of the irrigation systems are now left without water. And so this is an area where people just, so in other words, hundreds of thousands of people have been left without clean drinking water. Farmland has been flooded. There's not water available for agriculture. Uh, many are left without power. And it also caused widespread environmental damage. Um, the, just recently, a couple of days ago, Reuters re reported that the Ukraine environment environmental minister said that the destruction of the jam, dam caused 1.2 billion euros in damage and um, said that some 20,000 animals may have been killed. Mm -hmm. um, it's completely washed away certain ecosystems. And then an, another thing uh, that we can use to sort of maybe wrap up this, this section on, on, on this particular dam is that it has huge strategic Im implications for the Ukrainian military uh, efforts and counteroffensive to reclaim territory in the south of the Dnipro. Um, so again, this is, this is an interesting place for us to start this episode because a lot of the things we're going to talk about have al we've already mentioned here in terms of yeah. potential benefits, but a lot of costs associated with what happens when, when a dam is breached. 
Yeah. And, you know, well, I get, I, I kind of have two thoughts here as we, as we round out sort of this section on, on Ukraine, but the first is that we, we sort of just completed our, I mean, we did, we just completed a two part episode series on first, you know, bread. And then, you know, the second part, we just sort of talked a lot more about wheat. That's right. And sort of, and, and within that conversation, we started talking a little bit uh, about, about Ukraine and Russia and sort of that, that war's impact on on global food supplies and and wheat exports and all that uh you know that that kind of fun stuff and now i'm going back and thinking especially after you know hearing you talk about the flooded farmlands and sort of the, the areas without irrigation or irrigated farmland now i'm going back thinking okay so <laughs> what's this now going to do to maybe again sort of maybe the wheat supply uh that's we, oh, I guess we just don't have any answers to, but I, I think there's some questions to be raised. Uh, yeah, just just to be raised. This is there. a situation mm-hmm. to follow because the, <clears throat> the impacts of this are are going to be long lasting, and I mm-hmm. think you know repairing this, particularly in the context of a war, but even if that wasn't happening, if this conflict wasn't going on, repairing something like this is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a huge effort that would take I think a long time and a lot of money. So yeah, um, and well, this and that- is. A cautionary tale, perhaps. Yeah, and that was sort of my my second thought as we ended here is is that I think this very tragic example does provide a, a really good example of you know the costs associated with dam failures, for regardless of what what caused the dam dam to fail. Right, this isn't the first dam to fail. It won't be the last dam to fail. Uh, for natural or human-made reasons. And when you store that much water behind sort of a gate and all of a sudden it's able to come rushing out, there's a huge toll to be exacted on the land and on the people and the wildlife there that obviously would never have had this issue had the dam not been built in the first place. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we can think about throughout this episode, and listener, you can think about, is that there's also a pretty big difference between smaller dams and larger dams and that there's a costs and benefits associated with each. The larger the dam, sometimes the larger the potential benefits, but also as illustrated here, some of the costs can be amplified with a larger dam as well. So, uh, you know, we can define a dam. I think everybody knows what it is, but it's a, it's a structure that controls the flow of water on a river or stream and creates a reservoir behind the structure and what people may be less familiar with, some listeners, are the various kinds of dams. And we won't be exhaustive here, but we'll mention several of them. Mm-hmm. So there's an arch dam, which is uh, made of concrete or masonry, uh, which is curved upstream so that, that focuses the major part of the water load to the abutments on the side. So that's a structural thing. There's a buttress dam, which uh, buttress dams are usually made of reinforced concrete, uh, and the water tight part is supported by a series of buttresses. Mm-hmm. There's a diversion or sometimes called a deflection dam, which is constructed to divert water from a river or stream uh, into a different water course. So maybe part or all of the water stream to a canal or an aqueduct or something like that. Um, there's an embankment dam, uh, and which is a dam constructed by excavated materials, you know, such, such as earth. Uh, sometimes it's called an earth dam, maybe materials are dredged um, or rock is used. So this is using mostly natural materials to to create a dam. There's a gravity dam, which is a dam that's built of concrete and or masonry, uh, of which the stability rests on the weight and internal strength of the dam. Uh, hydropower facilities are located on, on some dams, and not all of them, but on, on some of them. And they're configured in such a way that flowing water turns turbines, which generates electricity. Uh, A few more here, we'll just go over a masonry dam, which I've mentioned before, I think is made of stone, brick, or concrete blocks and joined with mortar as opposed to concrete or reinforced concrete. And then a tailings dam is usually earth fill embankments um, that are byproducts of mining operations. And the largest of these is located in Alberta, Canada. And so, so it sounds like, uh, and maybe we're about to get into this, but dams, I think, are generally perceived of as being a power generating, you know, utility structure, something like that. But I don't think that's actually the case for a lot of dams. I think 
Dams are built for a wide range of reasons. That's right. right? In fact, let's that's that's what we're getting into right now. Let's talk about the reasons for constructing dams. What are the benefits? And we sort of kicked it off with uh, power generation. Most dams in the world are not harnessed to to generate electricity, but but some are, and some generate quite a lot of electricity. So, mm-hmm. you know, if we go back in history a little bit, and we'll we'll go back further uh, in, in a few minutes in the second section, you know, early on, water wheels were used to generate mechanical power, and today dams are, are used to generate hydroelectricity. Uh, according to the United States Energy Information Administration, um, hydropower accounts for approximately 16% of the electricity that's generated in the world. So... Um, in terms of alternative energy sources, I think that's the most. Um, and 71% of renewable energy creation in the world comes from hydroelectric power. Which is, I mean, that's a lot, right? That's, that's a lot. We we think about, I think generally, we think about renewable energy today and we think about it within the context of wind energy like when we were, when we did our wind wind energy episode that's right or we think about it in terms of solar energy which is you know will be a future episode but is also a it just it captures a lot of sort of media attention especially when you know you hear about x amount of power being generated off of some new sort of power station or something like that but i think this just goes back to prove you know something that we've maybe maybe talked about is that Wind energy and solar energy, while very promising, are still a very small slice of the already small slice of pie that is renewable energy. That's right. And mm-hmm. hydropower definitely exceeds solar and wind power in terms of energy generation. Well, and it's uh, also I mean, very it, consistent, right? It's like yes. a river. If you build does, a dam, it can be consistent, you exactly. know, provided that the water levels are there. And that's an issue in a lot of places, mm-hmm. but it, it can potentially be much more consistent. I mentioned 16% of overall energy generation in the world comes from hydropower. That number in the United States is about 6%. So a little bit lower than the global average. Interesting. And I I, I think that's probably pretty regional too. Yeah. It, there's mm-hmm. a geography to all of this. Yeah. And that's definitely true uh, for hydroelectricity in the United States. Tell me, what what do you think some of the other benefits for or reasons for Well, I mean, you sort of said one when you were running through the kinds of dams that I didn't really think about, but it sort of got my you know gears turning, which was, you know, building canals. Right. Um, and so two of the you know biggest canals, the Panama Canal and the Suez, Suez Canal uh, in Egypt, those absolutely have have they have to have dams and locks and everything to be able to control the water. Right. Because you're. You know, I, I think when I first saw how a ship travels, there's like a video out there that shows how a freight ship travels through the Panama Canal. You know, I think without looking at this video before, then you would sort of just see, you would sort of just assume that the boat is just sort of running through this natural kind of river-like environment. Right. They like sort of carved a hole in the country. No, but there's, as you said, there's a series of locks there's, where the water level will change and they'll exactly. isolate this particular mm-hmm. area. And it's, uh, it's a definitely more complicated process than they've created a canal that just goes through Central America. Right. So like, yeah, exactly. So yeah, literally being able to, you know, raise these mammoth ships up to a level which with which they could then carry on and um, deliver their goods, you know, worldwide. I think dams through canals have had an incredible impact on sort of global trade, uh, obviously. Yep. And then, I mean, irrigation is the big thing. As well. well, and that was going to be my one next of, one was one of the big reasons for creating a dam is to create a reservoir mm-hmm. in which to have a dependable supply of water for farmers um, throughout the year. And so irrigation is a, is a big reason here. Uh, that reservoir also is, are, the reservoirs are created to generate a dependable source of drinking water for people, for livestock as well. So that's another reason. Yeah. Uh, and I, well, I was ahead. just going to say, I think I've heard of and I don't know if this necessarily uh, factors directly into irrigation, but I've heard of dams being used to simply just redirect a river, not necessarily not necessarily create a reservoir, but literally just to send a river down to another you know area or or down another path for whatever reason that might be. And sometimes canals are used without dams to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Rio Grande between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez would be a really good example. Oh, of that. interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the another reason for for constructing dams deals with flood control right so so protecting areas from flooding protecting human settlements protecting crops from flooding uh, is is another motivation uh, improving navigation so if you flood rapids in rocky areas and uh, it, you can improve navigation and increase trade uh, and then you can also create a reservoir in which leisure activities take place. So that's, you know, certainly maybe not at the top of the list, but certainly that has been something that's been important as well. Um, and then job creation. So, you know, oh, that's, constructing, a huge that's a huge one, you know, certainly during the construction phase is when most of the jobs kick in and then there's the operation phase as well. Let's, I think we need to take a break. And when, when we come back, we can talk about some of the costs and problems associated with construction of dams. All right, let's do it. Here's some uh, some very quick ads for you all. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Geography is Everything podcast. Today, it's Geography is Dams. We just talked about some of the motivations, uh, the the benefits associated with dam construction, and now we're going to talk, spend a few minutes talking about some of the the problems uh, or costs associated with dam construction. Jeff, what are you thinking? Well, I, in terms of costs, I'm going to just go ahead and say that uh, these things probably cost a lot of money to me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, which is probably not the exact cost that we were looking for, but I just I felt like I needed to call that out that these these things probably you know very expensive. I think, you know, in terms of when I think of costs, just sort of knowing my background, I, I often go directly to sort of the environmental costs. Uh, and that would be mostly on the overall health of rivers. And I think, again, at, as we talk about dams, I, I don't know, and because I've seen some maps that were pretty shocking to me. I don't think people realize just how many dams are on any given river, uh, where they can not just, not just a single dam, but there's, you know, a series of dams all the way up the river. And that has a cost to the river's health at each sort of step of the way. Uh, very detrimental, especially to things like the fish species or salmon, you know, very important to the, uh, those of us here in the Pacific Northwest. A great example with salmon. So in the Pacific Northwest, salmon swim upstream. I mean, in other places too, they swim upstream <laughs> to spawn. Uh, but the dams create a barrier for the fish. And so one of the things that's been innovated here on, in the Pacific Northwest are fish ladders, which will allow fish to navigate that. And then also trucking fish from one side of the dam to the other. I've even um, seen a video of this contraption that I don't, I swear it was supposed to be a joke, but I actually don't think it was going to, it was supposed to be a joke, but where like a fish would like be like loaded up into this thing. And then they would almost like catapult them over. I've not heard of that. <laughs> it was, it was pretty bizarre. I don't think it ever got beyond maybe the testing phase. <laughs> well, these are, you know, these are the things that have to be dealt with, right? As you mentioned, there's a threat to biodiversity. Uh, ecosystems can be very drastically altered. You're inundating an enormous amount of land for their reservoir, which will completely change, uh, you know, part of this ecosystem. Uh, there's threats to animal and plant species, so there's there's a lot on, on the environmental side. Um, but of course, there's a lot, there's a huge impact on people as well. So the inundation of land can result in people losing their homes, losing their livelihoods, forcing them to relocate. And tens of millions of people have been displaced by dams worldwide. Um, and then when you're inundating a whole area, you're also putting places that have huge religious or cultural importance underwater. And a lot of times it's indigenous people who don't have a lot of political power uh, in terms of how dams are created or what they're going to look like or what where the location is going to be. And so there have been many cases throughout the world of, of local people, indigenous people, losing places that are important to them, losing their ability to, to conduct their their traditional economies. Mm -hmm. And so those are issues as well. There's also the risk to human life if a dam fails. And we, we just mentioned that when we started the episode, um, so that if a, if a dam were to, to be breached or completely collapse or something like that, there's an immediate impact on people. And then there's the long-term impact on people as well. Right. Because you're with that amount of water, and I imagine this is going to be an issue in Ukraine, you know, looking ahead into the future that you are basically, I mean, you're saturating the soil. The, I mean, you could be creating whole new sort of wetland type top, topography with that amount of water that's probably not going to go away. 
in in the near future, right? It's not it'll probably stick around for at least a little while, at least in certain pockets, I imagine. Yeah. So this, and again, it's not really clear what they're gonna what they would be able to do to repair this. So this mm-hmm. is maybe gonna change things pretty dramatically for a long time. Uh, one of the issues that's associated with dam construction, if they don't burst, is that the water quality sometimes decreases behind the reservoir. And so there have been a lot of places where that's been the case. The water sort of stagnates and uh, water quality decreased, which is bad because one of the motivations for having the reservoir in the first place is to have clean drinking water, to have mm-hmm. water that's available for agriculture. Um, there's also the issue of building up sediment on the base of dams. It changes the sediment flow, obviously, to, to block a river. Uh, and this can cause all kinds of environmental damage, um, re- reduce biodiversity for aquatic and other species, and then areas downstream that aren't getting that regime of sediment it would normally get may be more prone to flooding as well. So although this is dams are sometimes due to mitigate flooding, there can be cases where this might actually cause places to become more susceptible to, uh, to flooding as well. Well, let's turn our attention towards the history of dams a little bit. And let's, let's consider how long humans have been creating dams. And apparently the earliest known dams were in what was then known as Mesopotamia in what is current oh, wow. day Jordan. Uh, and there's an area called Jawa in Jordan. And there have been some remains of dams there that date back to 3,500 BCE. Wow. So I that's think- a long time. That's a long time. And I think this is, again, this is one of those things I, you know, I think we've made sort of this, you know, quote unquote discovery a few times on our podcast here, where as you hit the the history part of this, it always is something that has gone back farther than you probably think. Right. I think, again, you know, not, not being an expert in this field, you know, coming into this conversation around dams, especially around the context of hydroelectric generation, you start to think, Okay, maybe they were doing some damming stuff, you know, inside the middle uh, middle ages period, you know, in Europe to like, you know, start milling grains or something like that. But certainly this goes back much further. And much in fact, further this back. is just what we have evidence for. So, I mean, it's right. pretty easy to believe that much smaller dams were created in various places throughout the world uh, to create maybe smaller reservoirs for once agriculture was innovated mm-hmm. in different parts of the world. Um, this particular set of dams, apparently there were three of them. One was a masonry gravity gravity dam, which was meant to act as a reservoir. And then the other two were diversion dams to bring water to the reservoir. Um, the largest of these was 15 feet tall, 80 feet long, 15 feet at the base. Again, this is something that was created like 5,000 years ago. Wait, incredible. Uh, right? I couldn't, I couldn't make a 15 foot dam myself, <laughs> even with all the technology I have. <laughs> So this this apparently the motivations for creating this particular dams in Jawa were to control flash floods and to store water for dry summers. And if we jump ahead uh, about 700 years to 2700 BCE, uh, we find evidence of the Saad del Kafara Dam in Egypt, uh, which unfortunately apparently or, or uh, failed as soon, almost as soon as it was completed because of the lack of a spillway and oh, it was no. washed away by a flood. So uh, this is just something else in the historical record. But w- here's another interesting piece. The oldest dam still in existence oh, is the Lake, okay. yeah, the Lake Homs Dam uh, on the Orentis River in Syria. It's about 20 feet tall and was built around 1300 BCE for irrigation. No way. And still operating. So it's a masonry gravity dam that's a mile long, 23, f- 23 feet high. And Lake Homs, the reservoir behind it, continues to uh, provide water for the people of Homs today. That's incredible. I mean, obviously, there's a certain amount of upkeep and maintenance that goes with that because, you know, water is, uh, you know, it'll it'll erode, you know, things over, you know, hundreds, thousands of years. But still incredibly impressive that... Yeah, 20 feet is tall, but I mean, we're going to be looking at dams that are hundreds and hundreds of feet right. tall. And so, uh, like you said, maintaining a dam of a little bit more modest size is maybe mm-hmm. over a long period of time. Obviously, it's happened, and so it yeah. can be done. So that's that's interesting to think about, um, again, the size of a dam and how long it's going to last and, and the cost involved. If we jump ahead to the first century CE... Um, I believe 
we find dams in various by already operating and, and being constructed in different parts of the world, including Southwest Asia that we've already talked about, India, Sri Lanka, China, uh, Persia, which is currently Iran, mm -hmm. um, the Roman Empire. There were dams that were constructed, um, and a few of these, I think, in Spain are still in operation. Have been in operation for some two thousand years. Uh, the Romans, I guess, are probably more known for their aqueducts. But mm -hmm. you know, this is this is an illust this is a moment where we might highlight that the creation of dams, the building of dams, is intricately connected to the power of central governments, or mm. what today we would call state governments. And so they're both a reflection of that power, but they also contribute to that power. So there's sort of a dialectic going on where the arrow goes both ways and dams and state power help construct each other in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we're thinking about this, you know, I was pretty surprised, you know, by, you know, sort of when dams started, but I guess now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense, right? You have this, this river and, the river brings you a very valuable resource, right? I think humans have known that for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But rivers are unpredictable. They're prone to things such as flooding or drying out, that kind of stuff. And so I think humans being humans, there's a natural sort of desire to control and extract a little bit out of something that is so incredibly valuable to you. Well, there's um, also moments that people may have seen where, there was a landslide or something, mm -hmm. and that created a natural embankment, a dam uh, that was created. And there's a couple really big examples of this in the world where you know changes that have happened in the natural environment have caused dams to form. So that's an interesting way to consider also mm -hmm. how people may have come up with this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Middle Ages, I think you mentioned, is, is an era where many dams were built in Europe. This is in the pre-industrial era. And as we move into the industrial era, it will be very important for powering factories and mines. Um, the Netherlands is a country where many people are living on land that has been what they call reclaimed from yeah. the water. And so the construction of polders and dikes, but also dams, uh, has a pretty prominent and special role in the Netherlands, for example. Yeah, and I think the Netherlands is a very interesting case study in dams or damming in general, because they're not just damming rivers. I'm sure they are damming rivers, but it's not just rivers. They're almost damming the ocean, right? They're yeah. Well, there's, there was an area <laughs> that's called the, um, that used to be called the Zuder Zee, which is an extension of, of the North Sea that has been cut off with a large dike and formed what they call the Isomir, which is a lake. Mm -hmm. And then from that area, areas have been drained and some pretty large cities and a lot of villages, a lot of agricultural land has been reclaimed from the ocean, as you're talking about. Yeah, which then, like, again, not to keep going back to sort of the failures of dams, not saying that this is going to happen to the Netherlands anytime soon. But if one of those were to fail, the Netherlands could find itself in a situation that's you know pretty bad overall, just with the amount of land they've rec reclaimed, how many people are living on it, sort of their uses of that land over the last, you know, few centuries, however long that they've done this for, I'm not exactly sure. There could just be a lot of impacts, although I'm sure they have some sort of uh, a fail-safe system as well. Well, I mean, the, the engineering in Netherlands, I think, is extremely well-known throughout the mm -hmm. world because I think the, the the dike that holds back the North Sea has not been compromised, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a lot, of, a lot of faith in, in what's going on. And you know, creating areas, using polders to create dry areas for agriculture has been happening for a long time in the Netherlands. Let's move the story to the 20th century. And let's, I think of maybe four or five examples of dams in different parts of the world. So we can look at some cool. case studies to, 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 tra to track, you know, what the benefits and what the issues and what the controversies are. And, uh, and in each case, Let's you know remember keep in the back of our minds that, that that thing that I mentioned about that the power of state figures really prominently mm -hmm. political powers is really highlighted uh, and there's a lot we could there's a lot more we, each any one of these dams could be an entire multi series podcast in and of itself but as we do here we're going to try to give some highlights here to give people an idea of what's going on so mm -hmm. people can do further research and just to make it part of our conversation in in a one hour podcast and the first of these is the Kariba Dam, 
which forms Lake Kariba on the Zambezi River between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Uh, this is a dam that was completed in 1959. It's a double curvature concrete arch dam that's 420 feet tall, uh, 1,900 feet long. And the at its maximum, the artificial lake that was formed behind it was the largest artificial lake ever created on the planet. It extends wow. for some 170 miles, apparently. Oh, wow. No, that's, <laughs> that's a big lake. <laughs> that's a big lake, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a large hydroelectric plant that's part of the dam. The dam was constructed, un constructed under the period of English colonial rule and funded in large part by loans from the World Bank. And uh, apparently very little assessment of the costs that people in the area would bear and the potential environment or environmental impacts were conducted at this time, which speaks to that colonial power and mm -hmm. coming up with an engineering feat that would be beneficial for the economy of the colonial power with very little regard for what was happening on the ground to people there and people having very little influence over the, you know, the location of this, I think was controversial, for example, one of the well, things. And I'm also, you know, when you mentioned that the World Bank funded it with a loan, I'm assuming that, uh, uh, I don't know, either Zambia or Zimbabwe sort of inherited that loan as well. That's, I don't imagine. That would, would be what I would surmise as well, right? Yeah. So you know, independence comes with debt all, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, right? Yep. Political independence. Um, 86 workers at least lost their lives building this dam. Uh, tens of thousands of people, and I saw this statistic a few times, 57,000 people were displaced and had to move to make way for the reservoir. Many of them then found themselves in areas that were less agriculturally productive and and much harder for them to, to make a living in. And of course, generations have had to deal with the impacts of that relocation as well. Um, today, apparently, the water levels are at an all-time low. Oh, wow. And the dam is also at high risk of failing, apparently. Um, I think some of the hydroelectricity has already been shut down. And so there's, you know, this was a controversial project to begin with, but now we have problems that are associated with the demise, the potential demise of the dam and what happens if this becomes compromised or if this fails. And, you know, even at a low point, a, a huge artificial lake and what would happen downstream from there is a huge concern. Is this primarily due to, I'm, I'm assuming it's due to a drought of some sort. I believe that's the case. Right. Yeah. And of uh, course, and the role of climate change is being considered here. Um, so that's that's another thing to throw into the mix. That was going to um, be my my next thing was that this is probably due to some factor of, of climate change. I know, you know, Zimbabwe is not super close to South Africa, although it's, you know, it's, it's not entirely far away from either. I just know South Africa has been having some very severe drought issues as well. So, and I know that they've talked a lot about climate change within respects to that, that drought. Um, I am looking a, at a map of Lake uh, Kariba here and it is quite large. Although I imagine today that this lake has sunk a little bit based on sort of what you've, you've talked about already. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, Let's bring this story to the United States for a moment, the story of dams created in the 20th century, and we'll talk about the Hoover Dam. All right. Which we've, which we've already mentioned in previous episodes when we were talking, yeah. our very first episodes were about what if the uh, southwestern part of the United States runs out of water, and so this is directly related to that. Edgar and also Hoover, experiencing low, very low, like all-time low of l levels for um, Lake Mead, which is the reservoir behind it. This was a dam that was constructed, uh, I guess the completion was 1936. And then so from 1936 to 1957, it was the largest dam in the world. It's a concrete arch gravity dam on the Colorado River on the Nevada, Arizona border. It's 726 feet tall. Oh, that's it huge. creates hydroelectricity for approximately 8 million people. Uh, source of drinking water for... Las Vegas and places in California beyond it. Um, of course. <laughs> incidentally, the largest dam in the United States currently is the Oroville Dam in California, 770 feet, a little bit taller. Uh, and then the hydroelectricity plant at, at the Hoover Dam 
is one of the largest, I believe the largest hydro, hydroelectricity facility in the country. Yeah. And we, we, I think we talked a little bit about this going back to our very first two episodes on, on water in the Southwest. And if I remember correctly, that the hydroelectric facilities at Hoover Dam uh, power much of, of Arizona and some parts of California, but I actually don't think it powers that much or gives that much uh, power to Las Vegas, if I remember correctly. That may correctly. be the case. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I, uh, I think some of it goes to Las Vegas, but I think, okay. you know, I think you assume that the proximity and just how much power a city like Las Vegas probably uses, that you would assume more of it. But I guess when this was, when all these contracts were probably written up in the 1930s, Las Vegas probably didn't get as much of a share because it wasn't that big of a city at the That's time. That's right. Yeah. So very interesting geographies here related to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this, the creation of Lake Mead was controversial for a number of reasons, the environmental damage that would do, but also the loss of sacred and cultural spaces to Native American groups, the negative impact on Native American livelihoods. Um, and this is a dam that at least 100 people died working on the construction of the dam. And a lot of times it was Native Americans who were given the most dangerous jobs that involved blowing up certain mm -hmm. areas, basically sticking dynamite into crevices and um, so very dangerous stuff. When we talk about the power of the state, this happens to be a dam named after a U.S. president, right? So the legacy of that. Um, and here's a quote that I have that is going to be a repeat from that first episode, but I thought it bared repeating because of what we're talking about. This dam was initially named the Hoover Dam in honor of then President Herbert Hoover, who had led the negotiations for the 1922 Colorado River Compact that apportioned the river's waters between the upper basin and the lower basin. Now, once uh, FDR took office in 1933, Roosevelt, his interior secretary, changed the name to the Boulder Dam. And then Congress then subsequently changed, renamed it the Hoover Dam in 1947. So the the political uh, the political implications of naming dams and the power and legacies all are pretty pretty starkly evident with the Hoover Dam. Just just clearly on display. Just that's right. <laughs> the, the politicking back and forth. Thought I'd mention also as a little sideline to the to the Hoover Dam, the Glen Canyon Dam, which is also on the Colorado River, another huge dam, um, hundreds and hundreds of feet tall. It forms Lake Powell, which is, I think, 186 miles long, has a massive hydroelectric plant. Um, the, the, the Glen Canyon Dam, also the same kind of thing happening where it's covering up lands uh, that had been sacred and important economic uh, resources for Native American people. This was a dam that was fought by many uh, individuals, including David Brower, who was the first executive director of the Sierra Club, and is one oh, of the individ one of the individuals that was instrumental to the development of the modern environmental movement. Um, and in his lifetime, also fought to remove the dam. Oh, interesting. Hmm. And but the dam is still there today. The dam is still there today. Hmm. We will, let's talk more about, there's a couple more case studies I want to get to in different parts of the world, but we need to take a quick break. Let's do it. Let's do a quick ad break and then we'll, we'll hit another couple places in the world. Here we we'll go. We'll be right back. Geography is dams. That's the topic today. Welcome back. And we are just got done talking about a dam called the Kariba Dam in Zambia, Zimbabwe. We talked about the Hoover Dam, the Glen Canyon Dam. Let's let's move over to China now and talk about the Three Gorges Dam. Uh-oh. This is one that I definitely have heard a lot about. I, I remember very hearing a lot about it in the years up until that it was going to open, um, mm -hmm. which was 2012 now. So that's the year it became operational. I mean, a lot of the dam was created before then. This is a gravity dam on the Yangtze River in central China. It's made of concrete and steel, 594 feet tall. And the hydroelectric plant associated with the dam is apparently the world's largest capacity hydroelectric facility. Oh, I mean, I've seen a picture and... I, it's like the Hoover very Dam is very long. Yeah. yeah. So the, I, I see that exactly what I was going to say. The Hoover Dam, very impressive. You sort of see a picture. It's very tall. The sort of canyon that it's on, it's all very sort of spectacular in a way. 
Uh, the Three Gorges Dam, though, is it you're, like you said, it's very, very long. And I, I think that's just the river itself is also just very wide. And so you can sort of see why and how this river might be able to provide just so much energy. That's right. In fact, uh, circa 2018, the the plant on the Three Gorges Dam uh, generated 20 times more power than the Hoover Dam. Wow. That's, so that's impressive. <laughs> that's quite a lot, right? That's 20 <laughs> times more than the largest hydroelectric facility in the United States. I, I think I remember it during the time of construction, a lot of people were critical of it because, I mean, there are lots of dams on the Yangtze apparently, but nothing of this size. And mm-hmm. so uh, building a dam of this size was seen as controversial because it wasn't clear how well it would weather over time and whether the sediment would build up and they hadn't really dealt with the, the technology to release sediment through a dam of this size before. Uh, you know, the one thing we can say about the high electricity is that this is a country where a lot of coal is burned for energy still, for for power. And so this provides an alternative to that, um, which is which would be a positive thing. Important. The idea right? was, pardon? It's definitely important. And, you know, we say this all the time, but there's definitely going to be a geography as coal episode. We're talking, we've talked a lot about sort of That's right. alternative energies and sort of maybe some of the pluses and minuses of those. I think at one, one point we need to talk about coal as well. And I think generally, you know, an alternative to burning coal is, is better for the moment that we're in. Right. I mean, burning coal is one of the most deleterious ways to generate energy. Right. That mm-hmm. uh, the Three Gorges Dam, again, navigation was part of it, increased shipping on the Yangtze. A part of it was motivated also by controlling flooding. So in 1931, apparently 4 million people died in flooding on the Yangtze River. And so one of the motivations from the perspective of the government was to to be able to stop this kind of flooding and to save lives for, for an event like this. Um, point, point of clarification. In, yeah. In 1931 or up to 1931? I believe there was an event in 1931. Wow. Four million I, people. That's apparently. A, I'm, that's, maybe I okay. should do, have done more research on this to make sure I'm hitting that point correctly. But uh, this is brought up as one of the motivations for, for creating the Three Gorges Dam. And in addition to the other things we, we discussed, um, on, the, on the negative side, um, the project displaced 1.4 million people. So 1.4 million people, I mean, entire cities, villages and cities were, were completely inundated with water once mm-hmm. the dam came online. Um, this is and, what I had heard a lot about. Sort of so, the after so effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's people who had been living there for many generations mm-hmm. having to relocate to places where they are less able to support themselves and support their families. Um, places of great cultural importance were lost. And then there's the environmental aspect of things. So uh, a lot of environmental, ecological damage, increased erosion, increased landslides, uh, polluted water, the impact on biodiversity of plant and animal species, Many species were impacted, and one of the famous cases is the what is believed to now be either the extinction or near extinction of an animal called the baiji, which is a freshwater dolphin of the Yangtze. And you know, oh. using a dolphin as the face of of something is you know, it's a very charismatic animal. Right. And many other animals that have have been compromised, but this is an animal that was already in in huge decline um, because it's specific to this particular river. Um, but apparently this dam may have truly spelt the end for this particular species. Um, but that's just one of many that have been affected. Yeah. Let's spin the globe again and land, uh, in Guatemala. And there's a dam called the Chicxoy dam, which is made of reinforced, uh, concrete and there's a power station associated with this as well. It was constructed from 1976 to 1985 during a civil war in Guatemala, which went on for decades. The period of time in the early 1980s, from 81 to 83, I think in particular, were a particularly violent time in this conflict. And government forces massacred thousands of indigenous peoples. And directly related to the construction of this dam, 
was a 1982 massacre that led to the killing of 400 indigenous people, entire village or villages. Uh, many people during this civil war were displaced, disappeared, was torture. It was a very, very dark period. And this dam construction was supported by loans from the World Bank and the American Development Bank. So the incongruence of trying to develop a particular area in the context of a civil war where people are being massacred is drawn into very stark relief when we examine this particular case. Yeah, and I think maybe a common theme that I'm seeing through maybe all of these, maybe the exception being the, the Three Gorges, just because I'm not as familiar with sort of the indigenous cultures within China, but is the indigenous uh, opposition to dams in general. This seems to be a pretty common theme, right? So in, you know, in the United States, obviously, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe and Zamb Zambia, the indigenous people there, the uh, indigenous people in Guatemala all seem right, from to the, be... From the perspective of, of indigenous people who have been living in a location for mm -hmm. hundreds exactly. or generations, mm -hmm. maybe thousands of years without a giant dam. And then the power of the state comes in and you know, motivated by some good reasons, mm -hmm. but who has the power to decide is the question that we need to you know, factor into the, to the conversation here. And it's often those with, you know, political power who are living very far away from where these things are happening. Yeah, and exactly. And the benefits, you know, we, we can you know talk about those and we already have to a degree, but those benefits probably not often going towards the local indigenous people Anyways, right? It's usually going towards maybe, you know, a far flung off city that needs more power for, a, you know, a population that's swelling. But there's yeah, definitely. For, yeah. for families that have been relocated, for families that have had family members massacred, for families that have had somebody working on a dam that has been killed during the construction, that's what that dam means, right? Mm -hmm. All the benefits, they fall away when, when death of a family member is involved or death of a community member is involved. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, each of these cases, if we're looking at the Kariba, the Hoover, Glen Canyon, Three Gorges, Chicksoy, we see what some of the potential benefits are, but we see that it's coming at a very big cost. And often the costs are, there's a, you know, there's an unevenness to it. And it's mm -hmm. those with the least amount of political power often that are receiving the most negative aspects of this. Let's round out the the episode here it's gone by pretty fast for me i think <laughs> it um, really has there's yeah. a lot to talk about here um uh, and talk about uh, the damned of the world in other words the, the places where dams are worldwide and sort of try to characterize that a little bit if we can <laughs> and there's all kinds of different ways of categorizing dams and one of them is classifying dams as large if they're over 49 feet or 15 meters tall. So some of the statistics are batched that way. And there are well over 50,000 dams over 49 feet tall in the world. Wow. Um, a lot of China <laughs> has over 22,000. Oh, so they're leading. Them so by they, far. that's the country with the most large dams. Most of them have been built since 1949. In 1949 is the year when Mao Zedong established the People's Republic of China, uh, again, illustrating the power which dam construction is, is a project of, of state power. Mm -hmm. The United States is uh, the country with the second most large dams, which is 49 feet or more, over 6,300. Okay. Quite that doesn't few. surprise me. That seems, that seems about what I would guess, or I would probably have guessed a few thousand. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so quite a few, you know, quite a few. Uh, India over four thousand, Spain over four over a thousand, Japan over a thousand, Brazil. I don't have the statistics on, but I think is up there as well. Um, it, you know, there's dams all over the world, but these are the, some of the countries that have built the largest number of what they're classifying as large dams. And if we're talking about dams that are over twenty five feet tall, then China has over eighty thousand, and the United States has over seventy five thousand. Oh wow! So oh, that's interesting. So the United States has. A lot of dams, almost a as lot many of as China. dams that are under forty. I mean, but just, a bunch of dams that are large, that are over forty nine feet tall, but many more that are smaller than that. Are, is this? And we probably we probably don't have the exact answer to this, but I wonder if this would just be because many of the U.S. dams were built prior to something like the Industrial Revolution. I can imagine during sort of the colonial period, especially on the East Coast, Maybe. damming up like the Potomac, that kind of stuff. 
I think it may have also something more to do with that it's on smaller bodies of water, smaller rivers, mm-hmm. that making smaller dams with smaller reservoirs makes sense mm-hmm. and is easier to finance, things like that. Mm. Incidentally, can you guess the state with the most number of dams over 25 feet tall? Where do you think that would be? I would I would have gravitated towards like uh probably like Washington state or Oregon. I just know that there's a lot of dams here. It's you know we get a lot of our power. I yeah. would have also maybe have guessed uh New England states such as Maine. Uh, again, just knowing that there's a lot of dams and a lot of rivers yeah. sort of coursing through this area. But I'm going to guess have guessed that's not California the case. California maybe with California would have been, been a great one as well. Giant yeah, state, right? right? Lots of rivers. Mm-hmm. Apparently Kansas has over 9900 9, dams over 25 feet tall. See, I would have never guessed. <laughs> but, you know, Kansas, there's an enormous amount of agriculture that happens. There, there is, so yeah. That, that maybe helps explain why that's the case. Um, I guess I just don't, like, I, I when I think of Washington State or Oregon or California, for example, I think of just the pure wealth of rivers that course through these, certainly on the the wetter sort of western side of, of the, the mountain ranges here. And when I think of Kansas, they, I mean, I, I know they definitely have rivers. I guess I'm just it doesn't pop up to me as a place that would have a lot of rivers, but I guess maybe that's not even a requirement for having this amount of dams. You can sort of. Yeah. Various. I mean, if they're small dams, it might be on various places throughout exactly. the river. Uh, you know, maybe this is our regional bias kicking in a little bit mm-hmm. because we're more familiar with, with totally. what's going on close to home. Uh, what I wanted to look at where some of the largest dams in the world was, because I thought that would be interesting for us and our listeners to, to consider and then, of course, I found that there's different ways to categorize them. So there's, you can As go always. by the tallest, right? There's always, it's always more complicated <laughs> than you think when you start doing this research. There's the tallest dams. There's the largest by volume of structure. There's the largest reservoirs by volume. Um, there's the larger, largest hydroelectric power station. So these are all different ways that we can look at things. So let's, let's look at a few of these in terms of the tallest dams in the world. Um, the tallest dam is not a human-made dam. It is a natural dam created by a landslide in Tajikistan. It's the Yusoy Dam on the Murgab River, uh, and it is uh, 1,900 feet tall. Oh, wow. That- but this is, I mean, if you see a picture of it, it's, there's a huge landslide, and this was created by a natural occurrence. The largest human-made dam, dam made by people, is in China, and it is a concrete arch dam that is 1,001 feet tall, created in 2013. Oh, that's really, I mean, that's that's it's quite massive. tall. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> that's a big dam. The, the Hoover Dam is three quarters that size. Yeah. <laughs> so this is massive. Um, of the tallest 20 dams in the world, six of them are in China. I so think China that, has that an makes enormous sense. number of dams. Yeah. They have a lot of small dams. They have a lot of large dams, but they also have some of the tallest dams in the world. Yeah, and that, that makes sense based on sort of what, what you were saying earlier about the amount of tall dams that they have or large dams, mm-hmm. I think it was classified. If we switch up the, uh, the the factor that we're looking at here and go by largest by volume of structure, so the, the most concrete or whatever that's put into something, uh, we would be looking at the Tarbella Dam in Pakistan, which was created in 1976 largest dam by volume of structure. Um, the Fort Peck Dam in the United States, created in 1940. Mm. Uh, number three on the list is the Ataturk Dam in Turkey, created in 1990. Uh, and then if we were to look at the 20 largest dams by volume of structure, seven would be in the United States, two in Pakistan, two in the Netherlands, and two in Canada. And then oh, interesting. one-offs after that. Yeah, I would have expected China to feature a little bit more heavily in this as well. Also, I'm kind of surprised that Three Gorges isn't on here because, again, just seeing that picture and just yeah. seeing the just how vast it is. But I guess, you know, when you're talking about volume of structure, there's a lot that goes into it that's probably not seen as well. That's right. And some of these, these are all older than the Three Gorges Dam. So it makes me wonder what kind of innovations have happened since then that allowed less material to be used for a dam. Maybe that has something to do with it. The largest human-made reservoirs created by dams in the world, and this is by volume size, because there's also surface area we could look at, but by (laughs) volume size. uh, And these are also artificial lakes. They're not expanded lakes, because that would be yet another category, lakes that are larger (laughs) than they would normally be. 
Uh, and we've talked about one of these, Lake Kariba, the Kariba Dam on the Zambezi River, 1959. We talked quite a bit about that. That's the largest reservoir. The second largest reservoir is um, the uh, Bratsik River Reservoir on the Bratsik Dam on the Anagara River in Russia, which was created in 1964. Then comes the Lake Volta uh, Akosombo Dam uh, in Ghana. Created in 1965, um, the Manakugan Reservoir, or the uh, which is behind the Daniel Johnson Dam uh, in Canada in 1968. That's a multiple multiple buttress dam. Just to get yet another dam variety in our conversation. <laughs> uh, and then the fifth is the Guri Reservoir, the Guri Dam in Venezuela on the Crony River. Of the 20 largest dam made reservoirs in the world. Six are in Russia and five are in Canada. And those happen to be the, the countries with the two largest land areas. In the world. Yeah, I guess that makes makes a little bit of sense. I know, well, actually, Canada kind of surprised me. I feel like Canada has a lot of, well, I guess it, this, this my thought doesn't really correlate with what I was going to say. I was going to say Canada has a lot of like really large lakes. Therefore, why would they need to make, you know, large reservoirs as well? But that. That doesn't actually, I don't think location, hold location, I don't think that holds any water. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Well done. Well played. Uh, let's, let's close things out now and, and talk about something we, we haven't, I don't think broached yet on, on the episode, which is the removal of dams. Cause there's, there's a huge amount of support in certain areas to remove dams with the interest of re, re, returning rivers to their natural state, uh, reclaiming the lands that have been inundated um, and in eliminating some of the threats that are associated with with dams collapsing. And so over 900 dams have been removed in the United States between 1990 and 2012. I don't know the size of those dams. I'm guessing many of them are smaller ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, France and Canada are also countries that have had a large number of dams removed. Japan's first dam, because we haven't mentioned Japan in this episode yet, and we need to get that in there, <laughs> uh, was removed completely in 2017. So that will be interesting to see if that's the first of many there. Um, And of course, there's all kinds of debates and conversations happening over trying to balance what the negative impacts of of removing the dams would be or the negative impacts of having them balancing with what the benefits of removing or keeping them would be. Right. Because once you once you have that dam in in place and we sort of established this with the uh, the Ukraine dam situation today, once you have that dam in place, you're kind of, you know, you're you're faced with a choice of whether to continue on with the dam being in place and creating all the negative sort of externalities that exist with that, or removing it and having to deal with all the negative externalities that's, that's going to exist with that with that option, right. right? There's of course when you remove a dam, you're not just blowing it up and then moving, mm-hmm. you know, evacuating places. You're able to control the way mm-hmm. in which the flow happens, and so I think that's one of the motivating factors. One other thing that I didn't mention was that in the United States, uh, about 2,500 dams produce hydropower. So although we're talking about removing dams, there's also conversations about adding hydroelectric plants to dams that already exist because the dams are already there. Mm-hmm. And the you know the idea is let's have these generate power um, and, and, and in place of burning, burning fossil fuels or something. Right. Which I mean, to me that there's a certain logic there that makes a lot of sense, right? If the, again, if the dam is already there, barring any sort of other sort of issues around it, you know, adding at least a power generation aspect to it can maybe help redeem maybe some of the, you know, negative issues that may, might have surrounded it during its and building. And if that power can be distributed to people who are, mm-hmm. have less political power, that might be a way of, of right. addressing concerns as well. Um, the largest dam to date removed in the United States uh, were the Elwha dams in Washington removed between 2011 and 2014. So we're, you know, ending up in our region here a little bit. Yeah. And, and I think, I think it, you said this is, it was removed. It was, was Elwha dam just one dam or is it multiple dams? Or I believe it series? was multiple dams, oh, yeah. I believe. Um, and there are also, um, the Klamath dams, which if they're in the process of, I think, removing those, and this is uh, the river in Oregon and California, 
uh, and it's scheduled to be completely removed by the end of 2024. And if that is realized, then that will then become the largest dam. I think one of the dams is, would be the largest dam to have been removed in the United States. Yeah, and that's something that I've I've sort of been tracking for quite a while here in Oregon is the Klamath Dam removals. And I just know, sort of off the top of my head, I haven't I haven't you know dug up any additional information for this this episode, but just off the top of my head, that this was something that really was spearheaded by the indigenous uh, tribes uh, of the Southern Oregon, Northern California regions in order to have these dams removed in part to go back to sort of what we were talking about earlier, go back to sort of these traditions that were sort of taken away, which, you know, you know, tribal hunting areas, tribal fishing areas, these, these kinds of culturally very important uh, parts of parts of their tribal history that they haven't really been able to exercise with all of these dams along the Klamath River. That's right. So recognition of, you know, restoring some of the, the control uh, that, or, you know, the ability to, to operate uh, on this land in a way that was done for a long time. Um, and to remove dams would be to, to restore some of that uh, agency for Native Americans. And I think there was one, the Elwha Dam, there was one dam in particular that, which is, that was removed, which qualifies it as the, the largest dam. So just to circle back to that for a second. Gotcha. There's a lot more we could say about this topic. That's always the case. Listener, we hope that we've given you a good overview of costs and benefits associated with dams, where some dams are distributed throughout the world. A few case studies for you to consider, uh, maybe find out more about. Um, Jeff, what do we do next? <laughs> well, Hunter, we're going to do, uh, we're going to run through our pluggables. So uh, I oh, guess I can right. kick us off first. This is, okay. this is. I was sitting sitting in the guest seat uh, today. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me uh, over on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff, where I do smaller bite-sized sort of videos around geography and sort of geographic topics. Um, and actually, and Hunter, I'm going to pass it over to you and then I'll sort of close this out as well. Sounds good. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I am the co-author of Portland is a Cultural Atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. My co-author of those books is David Bannis. And of course, I am co-host of the Geography is Everything podcast that you are currently listening to. Yeah. And speaking of this podcast, if you are listening on an app such as Apple Podcasts or another app that allows you to write and review, uh, please consider doing so. We really appreciate seeing that. I think it really helps, especially for Apple Podcasts. It helps uh, sort of how Apple does their algorithmic magic um so if you you know enjoy this episode or you enjoy any of our other episodes please do that uh aside from that please join us over on substack that's geography is everything.substack.com where you can find exclusive uh, articles content additional bonus episodes all that fun stuff and uh it's just a way for you to interact with us a little bit more um so please do that and we will see you next time thanks for listening hope you tune in again <laughs>